Right, good evening, everyone. My name is Owen Westard. I'm going to be the chair um, tonight on behalf of LSE Ideas, which I'm co-director together with Professor Michael Cox. And it is really a great pleasure to uh, wish everyone, particularly Professor Chen, welcome to the second public lecture in the series uh, given by the Philip Roman professors here at LSE. This year, Professor Chen Jian uh, is with us. Uh, the uh, Philip Roman chair is made possible through a donation to the school uh, by Mr. Emmanuel Roman, uh, named after his father, Philip Roman. And it covers roughly the areas that LSE Ideas is working within, international affairs, diplomacy, strategy, both in terms of today's international affairs and in, in the sense of how they have developed over time, their history and their background. And it's a particular pleasure, of course, then to have someone who covers both contemporary international affairs and their historical origins with us for this year's Philip Roman Chair, Professor Chen Jian. Um, Chen Jian is one of the most remarkable historians that I know. Uh, he is someone who has an enormous range in terms of his knowledge, but that's not the most important thing about him. The most important thing about him is the breadth and the depth of the knowledge in terms of what he publishes. Um, he is someone who works very, very hard. Um, I think if you want to understand historical development, particularly over a fairly long range of, of time, of different ages, hard work is probably as important as good sources. And Chen Jian has both. He has the capability to work hard, and he has an outstanding grasp of the sources for China's contemporary history, and particularly its international history. He has written a number of books, there are two books in particular that have really changed the field in terms of how the outside world views China's uh, foreign relations and how they were created. China's Road to the Korean War, uh, which is, a, in the truest sense of the word, a path-breaking book uh, with regard to understanding how the Chinese Communist Party first saw the world, how, how they shaped their understanding of the world, and how that led in to the outbreak and then the fighting of the Korean War. Um, his other book that is probably the most known uh, among all of them is Mao's China and the Cold War, which is a sweeping survey of how Mao Zedong taught about international affairs and how his thinking changed over a number of years from the 1940s and up to his death in the 1970s. And today's lecture starts in that later period. What Professor Chen is working on is the concept of how China changed during the long 1970s from 1968 to the early 80s, or thereabouts. Uh, a project that is called, with the title for his lecture tonight, The Great Transformation, How China Changed in the Long 70s. Uh, it's a project that is not just about China. We'll talk more about this later on, I think. It's, it's about the world. It is about how changes in China fueled a set of changes, a series of processes of change, that really transformed the world in a more profound sense. Um, not just in terms of economics, not just in terms of planning and finance, but also in, in a political and strategic and possibly even cultural sense. And it's this remarkable transformation of China's road from the depths of the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s to a very different China that set out on the era of reform in the early 1980s that Professor Chen will tell us about tonight. So again, it's a great pleasure, Chen Jian, to introduce you here, to have you at LSE Ideas, and we're all looking forward to listening to you tonight. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the second time in three months' time that I will have, well, I will have to follow Professor Westhard's introduction. Uh, but this time it's different, his introduction, about uh, me and the presentation this evening. It's the first time he set a very high standard. <laughs> and also mentioned two things. When he's singing, when he's ping pong playing, <laughs> we will get to that eventually. Both of which you know that. have been perceived as a part of my capacity, but actually 
I doubt. <laughs> but this evening, as you can see, in his very short introduction, he already has summarized what I'm going to say. So if for, from this moment people decide to leave, <laughs> you already get 95% of this evening's exchanges. But this is not surprising at all. It is not surprising at all that Professor Westhard is in a position to give this introduction because actually in a sense, I am presenting here some of the shared ideas between me and Professor Westhard we have been working on a joint project that is known by us as the Great Transformation. So I have benefited greatly from the exchanges with Professor Westhardt. But today, I know I must do something even to surprise <laughs> Professor Westhardt. <laughs> and this is why I'm standing here. I'm standing here this evening to tell a tale. I'm going to tell a story. The great transformation that China had experienced in the long 1970s. And the meaning of the story is multifold. But if I must highlight, the most important meaning of it is that among all dramatic and important turns in the 20th century, the Great Transformation probably should be regarded as the most important. There are many reasons. One reason is so simple so straightforward. This is about China, the country with the long largest population in the world. And also probably more meaningful to the entire world is that this is also the country with the historical and cultural resources that have been generated from the country as one of the longest and certainly one of the continuous civilizations in human history. Entering the 21st century and especially at the moment that we will have to deal with the challenges of the 2008 financial crisis of the world, we are more in need of the support of resources in terms of intellectual power in terms of history, in terms of culture. And China is one candidate which is capable of providing the kind of enlightenment. And then, why do we name our project, China's Changes, as the Great Transformation? And why do we frame the time period in which the Great Transformation occurred in the so-called the long 1970s? I'm going to tell the tale. Once upon a time, there was a country that was known as Mao's China. It was a revolutionary country, internationally it challenged the existing international order and codes of behavior and norms. It challenged the Western dominated international structure. The revolutionary international policy of China had reached such an extent that it took the initiative to split the international communist movement by branding the Soviet leaders as 
traitors of true Marxism, Leninism. It's a, it is supported rebellions and wars in the name of revolution and national liberation throughout the world. From the early 1950s to the late 1960s, early 1970s, proportionally, Mao's China was more frequently resorting to force in dealing with international crisis than any other major international power. Domestically, Mao's China, from the moment of its, its establishment, was involved in Mao's revolution after revolution. Following Mao's utopian vision of turning China into a lender of universal justice and equality and prosperity, China experienced a series of revolutionary campaigns and movements. From the early days, the three Antars, the five Antars, the great movement to resist America and resist Korea, to the nationalization of industry and, and commerce, collectivization of agriculture, to the anti-rightist movement, to the great leap forward to the great proletarian revolution. Many episodes of the domestic, domestic history of Mao's China created such a disaster for the Chinese people. In the wake of the great leap forward, for example, maybe as many as 25 to 30 million Chinese died. During the Cultural Revolution, a whole generation, and that was a my generation, lost the opportunity of going to school. Mao's China was a revolutionary country, and it was a revolutionary country to the extent that no wonder policymakers in Washington regarded Mao's China as the most crazy, therefore most dangerous enemy in defining America's foreign policy. And for leaders in the Kremlin, especially when the Soviet party's first secretary was a, an equally interesting, probably less interesting person, whose name is Nikita Khrushchev. He once thought that it was necessary for a brain surgery to be performed on Mao, for Moscow to be able to deal with Beijing in reasonable, reasonable terms. However, dramatic changes began to occur in China and China's relations in the larger outside world in the late 1960s. This was when the long 1970s began. By the early 1980s, when the long 1970s Ended. China had experienced a series of profound changes. Indeed, what had occurred was qualified to be named, in our opinion, the Great Transformation. In a short span of a decade, time span of a decade or so, the Great Transformation registered several miraculous changes in China. It transformed the basic problematic underlying China's path toward modernity from revolution to development, laying the ground for a series of social, economic, ideological, political, and cultural 
changes to follow. It buried the Soviet-style, highly centralized planning economy, generating a market-oriented new economy that was increasingly integrating China into the global economy. It, un it undermined the people's commune system in the Chinese countryside and significantly weakened the household registration system in the Chinese cities, opening the door for China to change from a closed society into one that was increasingly more plural and dynamic. It legitimated such basic concepts is property ownership and credit in Chinese social and economic life, bringing about fundamental changes in defining the legal boundaries between the state and the society and between the public and the private. All of these domestic changes combined together to form the background against which China's international identity also changed. The Great Transformation turned China from a revolutionary country, which I summarized earlier, and an outsider of the existing international system into a fellow stakeholder, and increasingly an insider of the existing international system. Indeed, the Great Transformation is not just about China. Otherwise, it is not qualified to be named the Great Transformation. It produced huge impacts upon the entire world. In particular, it changed the orientation or even the essence of the global Cold War, presaging that the Cold War would end with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, and the failure of international communism as a 20th century phenomenon. Therefore, it is apparent that our definition of the great transformation is not the equivalent of the frequently mentioned China's reform and opening up process. Although our definition and understanding of the great transformation is related to the reform and opening up of policies for us, the great transformation is a longer, broader, larger and deeper phenomenon. In our definition and description, the Great Transformation began early. It did not begin. It did not begin in the late 1970s. It began in the late 1960s. It was not merely a process introduced and initiated from the above, but a process combining forces originated in the society and forces released by the state. It is with meanings broader than the Chinese reform and opening policies. In a larger and a longer historical perspective, the Great Transformation is an unfinished journey. Many of the fundamental tasks of the Great Transformation, the ones that according to the logic of the Great Transformation should be part of it, have not been accomplished. Therefore, the Great, tran great Transformation is an ongoing process. Then, why do we still call the Great Transformation in the long 1970s? 
And that is because by the early and by the latest, the mid-1980s, when the long 1970s was coming to its conclusion, most, if not all, of the basic questions that should be asked to define the Great Transformation had been identified and raised. And some of the most important changes that were crucial for the development of the Great Transformation had occurred as a result, neither China itself nor the world that China had been continuously entering and engaging could be turned back to the pre long 1970 period, 70s period. When the long 1970s ended, the Great Transformation had brought China and the world beyond the point of no return. It is impossible for me to try to cover such a huge project in my remaining 30 some minutes. So let me try to highlight five issues in my speech. These five issues are the spirit of 1968, the meanings of Chinese American rapprochement, the reform and opening at the process from below and from above, the legitimacy challenge issue, and finally, the Great Transformation is an ongoing journey. The so first issue I would like to highlight is what, is the, what was the relationship between 1968 and the origins of the Great Transformation? As we all know, in world history, 1968 was a year highly unusual. In 1968, in the capitalist world, we remember such things like Paris in May 1968, Japan, the left-wing revolt. In the United States, the anti-war movement, I don't know how many of you have watched the dark documentary, Berkeley in 1968. The assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, and also in Mexico City, the black activism showing black dignity in the Olympic Games. In the, intern, in the Soviet bloc, there was the Prague Spring, there was the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. In the Cold War, there was the Tet Offensive, so forth and so on. Why did all of this happen in 1968? There was something I will call as the global spirit of 1968. The outbreak of 1968, the spirit of 1968, was a global revolutionary phenomenon that had its origins in the post-World War II years. And in the longer historical perspective, it originated in the shaping and development of modernity and the accumulated legitimacy crisis that different patterns of modernity had created. Let me give an analogy. Just like in biology, a very, very long process of evolution is sometimes interrupted and with interruption, upgraded by sudden outbreak of genetic changes. Same is true in the case that the spirit of 1968 was created. So what is the spirit of 1968? If I must give a brief 
definition. And that should be the spirit of rebellion. And let me call the Chairman Mao in this case. Rebellion is by nature rational. In surface, it is about rebellions against existing regulations, rules, and institutions. In essence, it is about the desires on the part of younger generation to question the legitimacy of any existing models toward modernity because of the inner tensions existing in those models. So the spirit was given the quality of crossing ideological, national, civilizational, and cultural lines. If that were the case, why, among all stories of 1968, the Chinese story was not really told? China was a part of 1968. The Chinese experience of 1968 was extremely important. Indeed, that is why we took 1968 as a beginning point of China's long 1970s. It was in 1968 that Mao's Cultural Revolution and in a larger sense, the Maoist revolutionary programs reached the peak and began to decline. It was in 1968 that Mao's revolution's legitimacy was exposed to serious questions. I have an additional identity in this respect to discuss this issue. Because I was a student of grade 1968 in my middle school. I'm not here today to share with you uh, my whole experience of 1968. I just would like to mention one thing. It was in late 1968. I, at that time, 16 years old, together with a group of my fellow middle school students, we compiled and printed a collection of heterodox essays, dissident essays, and circulated them among our fellow students. That action invited a big trouble for me. It was one of the reasons why I was twice in, put into prison a few years later. But that also qualified me to speak about the Chinese 1968 from a perspective that can be combined with my personal experience. To talk about the decline of the Cultural Revolution, and then we must talk about what the Cultural Revolution actually is. The Cultural Revolution was the last effort on the part of Mao to try to instill legitimacy into the very much troubled enterprise of continuous revolution. When Mao initiated the Cultural Revolution, he had two interrelated purposes. He hoped that the Cultural Revolution would provide him with new means to promote the transformation of China's state, society, and international outlook. And also, he also desired to use the Cultural Revolution to enhance his own much weakened authority in the wake of such disastrous experience at the Great Leap Forward. Mao actually believed that these two purposes were interrelated because he believed that his own leadership role would best guarantee the success of his revolution. Mao easily achieved the second goal, to defeat his enemies and even to completely destroy at one point the party state control system. 
but he was unable to create the new type of force that was needed in order for him to place a new social order on the heart and the minds of the Chinese people. Then, among many of the events of 1968, on July the 28th, 1968, Mao decided to dispatch the workers of Mao Zedong Thought propaganda team into various Beijing universities. The Red Guards at Tsinghua University opened fire on the team. Mao responded with the decision to dismantle the Red Guard movement. For two decades, mobilizing the masses had been the key for Mao to maintain the momentum of his revolution after revolution. At the moment that he openly stood in opposition to the revolutionary masses, in order to re-establish the communist state's control over society. His revolution aimed at placing a new order in the Chinese people's hearts and minds. Failed. Mao's revolution was facing very profound legitimacy challenges. In retrospect, it was the failure of Mao's revolutionary programs that opened the door for the great transformation. <coughs> Why? Let me go to my second issue, meanings of the Chinese-American rapprochement. So conventional wisdom tells us the Chinese-American rapprochement occurred because of security considerations and strategic considerations. In the late 1960s, China faced a very grave international situation. In, uh, while America's involvement in the Vietnam War placed greater pressure on China's southern borders, the hostility between Beijing and Moscow culminated in, 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 in March 1969 when two bloody border clashes occurred between Chinese and the Soviet garrisons. Therefore, according to the conventional wisdom, Mao made the decision to woo Washington for dealing with the Soviet threat. The security and strategic centered arguments are not wrong, but they are incomplete. They ignored the legitimacy issues that was involved in Mao's decision to, pure, to pursue and achieve the rapprochement with Americans. Here I must emphasize one thing. For over two decades, anti-American imperialism stood at the core of Mao's revolutionary programs. It was not a, such an easy matter just because of security and strategic considerations for Mao to change the direction of China's international policies. What occurred was in retrospect a quite sophisticated maneuvering on the part of Mao and the Chinese leadership to adjust the legitimacy justification for Mao's China. First, the Soviet Union was named as the Soviet Social Imperialism, and therefore, by identifying it as China's most dangerous enemy, According to the age-old Chinese strategic method of borrowing the power from one barbarian in order to deal with the power of another barbarian, and also by adopting the long-time Chinese Communist United Front strategy that it is legitimate to ally yourself with 
the enemy of secondary importance in order to deal with the enemy of primary importance. You find <laughs> the legitimacy foundation for aligning China with the United States was created. But this was not the most fundamental issue that I'm going to argue. President Nixon visited China in February 1972, following what we mentioned the last time, the ping pong diplomacy. <laughs> he even played it out. <laughs> and the Chinese-American rapprochement occurred. Following it, you find something that was in dramatic ways framed occurred. In 1973 and 1974, Mao introduced his three worlds theory. According to the three worlds theory, let me read Mao's statement of it. The US and the Soviet Union belong to the first world. The middle elements, such as Japan, Europe, Australia and Canada belong to the second world. We are the third world. The US and the Soviet Union have a lot of uh, atomic bombs, and they are richer, more development, developed. Europe, Japan, Australia, and Canada of the second world do not possess so many bombs, and are not so rich as the first world, but richer than uh, the third world. All Asian countries except Japan and all of Africa and all of Latin America belong to the third world, the developing world. And the most explicit public statement that was made by a Chinese leader to the world about the three world theory was made by Deng Xiaoping. On April the 10th, 1974, Deng Xiaoping, as the head of Chinese delegation attending United Nations General Assembly, he openly presented Mao's three words notion, emphasizing that the third world was formed by the vast majority of developing countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And both Mao and Deng argued that the third world countries are now the bulk of forces favoring revolutionary changes in the world. What is important is that comparing the three worlds theory with early Maoist statements built around international class struggle-centered language. The three world series underlying key word, the basic problematic underlying the three world theory was no longer revolution. It was development. Think about this. Accompanied with the introduction of three words of theory with Mao's approval, a full modernization discourse entered China's domestic affairs. The full modernization discourse was not introduced in the late 1970s when the reform and opening process began. It was first introduced prior to the Cultural Revolution in 1965, but it was abandoned. And then in January 1975, at the fourth National Congress, at which Premier Zhou Enlai made his very last major speech on a national forum, he announced that China should aim to modernize its industry, agriculture, national defense, and science and technology by the end of the 20th century.
So somehow you find that by the larger of Chinese American rapprochement and by the changing legitimacy justification following the rapprochement, somehow a very significant and fundamental change in the Chinese perception toward how modernity should be pursued. And this occurred, of course, in the international contest that the Chinese-American rapprochement obscured the division between communist and capitalist forces. It greatly changed the balance of power between two contending camps using the diplomatic historian Nancy Tucker's word. Now, there are more communists standing on the side of capitalism than on the side of communism. Just think about this global implication of this change. Let me turn to my third issue. The reform and opening up is a process both from below and from above. Mao died on September the 9th, 1976, after a short period of political tra transition with Hua Guofeng, Mao's hand-picked successor as China's nominal head, Deng Xiaoping emerged in 1977-1978 as China's paramount leader. He then introduced the reform and opening policy. This is a familiar history to all of us. Many of us believe that the reform and opening up was a process initiated and carried out by forces from above. This is not wrong. Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese Communist Party and state leadership certainly had left their deep stamp on the shaping and defining of the Chinese reform and, and, and opening up the process. In this respect, the most important influential statement guiding the process was Deng Xiaoping's cat series statement. It's about White cat, black cat, so long as it is a cat that catches a mouse. It's a good cat. This is a, the philosophy dominating the reform and opening policies. However, the greater transformation followed a philosophy, a general statement. That was not necessarily different from Deng Xiaoping's CAD theory, but certainly more sophisticated, more ambitious, more far-sighted than the CAD theory. Where did it come from? It came from, certainly partially, from the above but mainly primary from below. Let me give you a few examples. The so first example was the criteria of choose debate. People probably know in Deng Xiaoping's ascendance, the most important event probably was the choose of criteria of choose debate. It is about where the Chairman Mao's teaching should be the basic criteria of choose or if the result of practice should be criteria of choose. By winning the debate, Deng Xiaoping was able to present his cat theory. But this was not a debate that was initiated from above. The first person who initiated this effort was a philosophy teacher at Nanjing University. He wrote the first draft of this article, which finally would be published by Guangming Daily, by himself. Then, 
Deng Xiaoping and his associates caught the value of it, changed it into, it into a major political debate. So initiative was from below, not from the above in this case. Let me give you my second example. People probably know that the Chinese reform and opening process first began in the Chinese countryside. And many times people mentioned that the undermining of the people's commune system began with the introduction of idea of relating household labor contribution to household income. Where did this begin? So that began even in the official discourse, description, in a very cold winter night in December 1978 in one of the poorest villages in Fengyang County, Anhui province. That is called the Xiaogang village. 18 peasants took the initiative to sign a contract in which they just put the communing system aside and made their own commitment to this linking labor input with income agreement. More recent studies have revealed that this actually was not the first time and certainly not the only time that the Chinese peasants took the initiative. All over China, even during the Cultural Revolution years, efforts such as this one that occurred in Xiaogang village in December 1978 already occurred. If the Chinese people's commune system finally was undermined, and that was because the Chinese peasants, millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese peasants who abandoned it in the first place. There are other examples I can give you. Reform efforts in the cities, such as incentive based reforms in factories, such as the introduction of the idea of special economic zones, such as the introduction or reintroduction of private ownership back into Chinese economy, such as dispatching Chinese students to study abroad. Each and every of these occurred first and foremost because of forces from below. If that is the case, let me turn to my fourth issue the legitimacy challenges. As I indicated earlier, the great transformation originated in the legitimacy crisis that Mao's revolutions had encountered. Underlying Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up policies were also profound legitimacy concerns. But the reform and opening up of policies were with extraordinary legitimacy support, especially when it was first introduced. And there are many different reasons. One reason was that the Chinese Communist Revolution, despite all the kind of legitimacy challenges that it had encountered, by itself, at one point, it was highly legitimate. 
In a few weeks' time, I will be giving another speech on the significance of 1949 in Chinese history. I will be discussing those issues. I will be discussing the legitimacy paradoxes involving the Chinese Communist Revolution and the Chinese Communist State. So I will not be going into details here. But as far as the reform and opening process is concerned, it legit must say came from below, from ordinary everyday Chinese citizens' embers of the reform and opening process, and that was because the greater Chuang formation. Again, that is a larger, longer, broader, deeper than reform and opening policies was in the final analysis. The enterprises of the people. It was not the enterprises of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Communist State. And the legitimacy of the reform and opening policy was gained because at one point, the Great Transformation and the reform and opening policies were overlapping. Therefore, the Great Transformation, by the nature of its own logic, at one point, while continuously overlapping with the reform and opening process, also departed from the reform and opening process. In retrospect, there are some missed opportunities indeed in the carrying out of reform and opening policies. One was in 1979, 1980, when a new constitution was made which removed people's rights for using big character poster to express themselves. And when the democracy war in Beijing was dismantled. This was an action on the part of the communist state to openly announce that people, we are with you, but we are also different from you. We are above you. There's another missed opportunity. In 1982, 1983, when the Chinese Communist Party was involved in the debate about whether Marxism should be compatible with the humanity. So many old revolutionary veterans stood out to say, yes, Marxism in the final analysis is about the perfection of humanity. How can Marxism be different from the perception and pursuit of perfection of humanity? The party, this dominant discourse, controlled by a few old communist ideologues. with the support of state power to claim that Marxism was not compatible with humanity. Fortunately, that particular page of history now has been overturned. If you read the current literature of the Chinese Communist Party, you will find repeatedly they now argue that humanity concerns should be the fundamental criteria of judging whether socialism is authentic or not. It's a good development. But what I want to emphasize that even with all these missed opportunities, even with this departing process between the great transformation and the reform and opening policies still by the early end 
by the latest mid 1980s. The reform and opening process, and in a larger sense, the great transformation, had been brought to the point or beyond the point of no return. It is impossible for China to go back to the planning economy. It is impossible for the Chinese society to be brought back to the closed door nature of feature. It is impossible for China to return to its isolated status. It is impossible for the released market force to be taken back. It is impossible for all those ideological driven discourse to gain the inner support of everyday people. But there's tension between the social and economic development of China and the lack of efforts to make the great transformation and the reform opening process more compatible with each other. This was the reason why finally the tragedy, the Tiananmen tragedy of 1989 was brought about. Now let me come down to the final point, which is also my conclusion. The Great Transformation is an ongoing process. Taking all of what I have discussed into consideration was what we discussed still the Great Transformation. Yes, we believe that this is still the Great Transformation. China is on a long journey toward modernity and beyond. So the story continues. One thing is more and more certain with the progress of this process. And that is neither China nor the world can and will be brought back to the era before the Great Transformation. The Cold War was over. The entire international scene has been changed. China has been changed. A very critical question we still need to ask is, how will China continue with the Great Transformation? Will it eventually lead to allowing China to climb to a higher or higher moral ground, or to realize political democratization? These are very difficult and challenging questions to answer. And it's beyond my capacity today and my time today to go into a detailed discussion of these questions. If there's one word that may properly characterize the prospect of the long journey of the grand transformation, it should be paradoxical, very paradoxical. In the meantime, as a historian, I'm cautiously optimistic. If there's one country and one civilization that are with, that is with the needed historical cultural resources to answer the questions that we have raised, it probably should be China. After all, it is one of the oldest and certainly one of the most continuous civilizations in the world. So let me conclude my speech by reading to you a few lines. 
a few most famous lines of a poem by a Chinese song time poet, Lu Yu. In Chinese, San Chong Sui Fu Yi Wu Lu, Liu An Hua Ming, Yo Yi Chun. The hills bend and streams wind. There seems no way out. Beyond dark willows and blooming flowers, a new village emerges inside. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anjan. That was a terrific, absolutely terrific lecture, um, and an immensely rich one in terms of its content. As you usually do, you have taken a whole uh, era that many of us consider to be very important for understanding the modern world, and maybe not turn it entirely upside down, but it's challenging many of the things that we thought we knew about how this transformation had, had taken place. Um, we have... Um, about 20 minutes or so for, for a Q&A session. I just wanted to open by asking you one question about the timing of what you are observing. Because one of the points, one of the many points that, that uh, you made, uh, which to me is, is essentially challenging the, the orthodoxy with regard to understanding of not just this period, but of China's rise in general, is that you put an emphasis on the forces from below in terms of this transformation. I mean, very often when we hear this debate, particularly the China-Soviet Union contrast, huh, the idea is that the Chinese succeeded where the Soviets failed because there was a plan for reform carried out uh, from above, very much from above, and under uh, conditions of strict political authoritarianism. And you challenged that in your, in your, in your lecture today. But what about the timing of this? How much of these seeds of the blooming flowers that you were talking about in, the, in, the, in this wonderful poem that you read at the end, how much of this was there in a concrete form before the end of the Maoist era, before 1976? I mean, how much of that do you actually see in existence already in this early part of the Great Transformation that you're talking about? And if you do see these, where did they actually come from? I mean, how did people, in a concrete sense, uh, build themselves out of this enormous tragedy that China was going through uh, during the Cultural Revolution, even in its latter phases? You know, I, I feel this is such a good opportunity because by keep, uh, presenting this speech, I'm not only subject myself to the examination of this distinguished audience, and especially by subjecting myself to the questioning and examination of my dear friend, <coughs> Professor Westhart, this is an absolutely wonderful question. This is what I feel. Um, the beauty and the tragedy of the Chinese Communist Revolution was that it both created opportunity for a very specific form of mass participation, especially during the Cultural Revolution for those of us who experienced the Cultural Revolution. And we must understand that this is not just a time of an upside down state party controlled movement. It was also a time because from Mao's own logic, rebelling is by nature reasonable. You also called upon and allowed mass participation. And further, if there's one thing that we must acknowledge that 1949, the victory of the Chinese Revolution, is a positive phenomenon, is something that occurred finally in the final balance sheet of history's calculation, is something that is for the better. 
and that should be, it had removed, not a, always intentionally by the communist state, but by the logic and sometimes by action of the Chinese communist state. It had removed so many barriers standing on the way of mass, particip mass participation. So just think about, you know, who was I? A 16-year-old middle school student. And in the year 1968, I knew nothing about Paris, Japan, Tad Offensive, Mexico City, Berkeley, Martin Luther King. Yes, I know he was assassinated. But still, how did this initiative come? There is you no know, to try to make a difference for the society. I think I just one of many. There is one sense that is described, defined by Mao himself. You must pay attention to inter important state affairs. That created space in many senses for the initiative to occur from the below. That also shows no force, no regime in the world, no matter to what extent people may call it authoritarian, dictator, dictatorship role, whatever we may call it, is capable of completely control each and every cell of the society. If there's one force that is most active in any history, in any circumstances, that is the initiative by ordinary citizens. And somehow, this is the case in the Cultural Revolution. So, for example, I mentioned uh, the, the peasants, mm. you know, who took the initiative to sign the contract. Mm. And so many now documentary evidence to show that even during the Cultural Revolution, when the Mao's discourse of forming the most tightly controlled collective form of production was in complete domination everywhere in China. The peasants trying to grow out of whatever fissure is existing there to favor their own mode of production. Other questions? Yes, over there. <coughs> Please. Yeah, thank you. I'm actually quite interested in uh, knowing your view about uh, Chairman Mao's role in this great transformation. Because you said something like, um, uh, you know, Chairman Mao designed the revolution to strengthen his diminishing power and defeat enemy, destroy the uh, party governance structure, and something like, uh, it's Mao's failure in the revolution that opens the door to the great transformation. So I'm just wondering um, if, you know, as a historian, uh, when you view Chairman Mao, do you think he has had any positive political legacy at all? Of Thank course. You. Mao reigned in China for 27 years. Mao was equivalent to the Chinese Communist Revolution in many different senses. Mao was revealed and described by many as a villain. And some even went so far to define, describe Mao as a person of action, a very low level, personal level, sexual level action. But Mao actually was a person of ideas. This is a, is a person of tremendous self-contradiction. If there had not been the Chinese Revolution, Mao probably could have been, become a 
good university professor who always caused controversies among his colleagues. I wouldn't have liked to have But his contribution month. and his damage would have been very, very different. And not just Mao, also Deng Xiaoping. You know, Deng Xiaoping was a person who had done so much, and many things are more easily to be defined compared with Mao as positive. But also, he was responsible for the Tiananmen tragedy of 1989. I believe, despite all the dark sides of Mao and Deng Xiaoping, they will have to be regarded as positive historical figures. That is because, despite all the dark sides of their own history, they interpreted, at one point, the very basic needs of China much better than many of their contemporaries. Now we are standing at the vantage point of history. It's very easy for us to try to compare Mao and Deng Xiaoping to our perceived better and more perfect figures in history. But we must compare China before 1949 and after 1949 with the China of the late 19th century, early 20th century. One thing certain, there's some historical figures which will be, who will be absolutely put on the same pillar of history like Adolf Hitler. But Mao and Deng Xiaoping, especially Mao, probably would be placed into the category like rubber spear. And maybe Napoleon. And in the Chinese context, Mao would like it. The first emperor. The emperor who unified China and created the Chinese empire. The first emperor is already more than 2,000 years ago a phenomenon. We're still debating about him. Let us debate about Mao. It's healthy. Let us, us also leave space for future generations to judge about our era. And my hunch is that probably Mao will be very much placed in the category like first emperor, like Robespierre, and like Napoleon. John. Um, that's it. You have to wait for the microphone. Thanks. Perhaps following on from the first question, um, to some extent, with Deng Xiaoping, I mean, I know there's no answer to this yes. at all, but given the fascinating lecture and the, the pressures, the context, the pressures from underneath, the whole overall context, from 1978, was he just, as it were, surfing away in a very pragmatic way, seeing the solution, the survival of the Communist Party being necessary through those reforms? Do you think he was, you know, in that sense, the extreme, the, the supreme opportunist who was following the wave? In a, in a sense, in the in a, a oversimplified version, and people may say this, but this is not Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping was no ordinary person. Deng Xiaoping was the person who, despite his, you know, very small physical size, was a very big mind also. But he was different from Mao. Mao was this person with a huge utopian vision. Mao was a person who read traditional Chinese literature, profoundly influenced by various Confucianist ideas, although he was anti-Confucianism in an apparent political level. But what made Deng Xiaoping a very big figure was his extraordinary sense of what was needed for the particular political interests of his country, his party, his perceived revolution, and his 
and, and the Chinese people. And the, the practical situation he was encountering. You know, Deng Xiaoping could be bigger. You know, he was a person who was responsible for all those missed opportunities. And he probably will be criticized repeatedly by future generations of historians because my hunch is that when China tried to go beyond the current paradoxical situation to try to climb, climb to a high moral ground, to try to pursue a process of political democratization with the features of checking and balances, much higher prices will have to be paid. But on the other hand, he did not lead China toward a worse path. It could be much worse. Mm. He read history's very basics in the general sense correctly. So in this sense, that is why Deng Xiaoping became Deng Xiaoping. Mm. You know, there are so many other competitors in his rank, mm. and he emerged. He became the person, even at the age of 87, mm. he still made the, the famous Southern Tour to try to regenerate the reform and opening process, which is both for his own reputation in history and also for his perceived course that would, that would benefit China. You know, it's a, yeah. I'll take a couple more questions. There's one up there. I'm going to join them together now. There's one up there yes. and one over here. Yeah. Good evening, Professor. Um, my question is um, related to what you mentioned during the uh, opening of your uh, speech about um, enlightenment, to use the word enlightenment. Um, it seems to me problematic um, from, a, from a distance that, uh, first of all, to equate characteristics of a developing country and somehow superimposing those on characteristics of a developed country. Now, would you agree that there is, uh, that, that, that problem does exist, um, as my first question, uh, with direct reference to China? And the second question is, um, is uh, uh, sorry, skip, skip my memory. Um, okay, one question uh, is good. Yeah, uh, no, actually, I've, 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 I've got also, two questions. It's not so good. I, I've, I've, I've got to it actually. Speak the chairman. Okay, I'm sorry, very sorry. quick, very quick. Uh, and, and I'm much more democratic than the chairman. And, and specifically, um, which which characteristic was the professor referring to? Which characteristics of Chinese development have the potential to enlighten? Hmm? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, over here, on the third row. Yes. Just raise your hand. There we go. Uh, uh, Odeep, question. Uh, what could happen to China if Mao died in year 1966? Uh, will, will there be the great uh, transformation occurring to China in the long 1970s? Or will China continue as a politically rigid party state that would most probably uh, decline and fall like the Soviet Union in the late 1980s or early 1990s? Thank you. A good pointed question. Yes. So should I answer? Yes, please. Okay, so talk about um, what are characteristics of this. I guess my, your question is about this development-oriented you know, thesis, to what extent it will be um, um, enlightening. Actually, there are two levels of question. One is in the context of the 1970s, in the context of the Chinese Revolution, which always took revolution as a basic prob problematic of China's path toward um, uh, modernity, by emphasizing development as a key word, you will find this revolutionary meaning of it. That's one thing. And secondly, when I say enlightening, it's not just the development-oriented thesis. It's the great transformation as a whole, because it demonstrated that in a setting, cultural historical setting, that was not a, a natural copy of Western past toward modernity. And still, 
through its own internal development, through inter-exchanges between itself and the larger world, by initiatives in many circumstances taken by forces from below, and through overlapping of forces from below and from above in different circumstances, although they departed. Mm. And then the great transformation could occur. Mm. Isn't that enlightening in terms of understanding about the possible path toward modernity? Mm. And then for, for Yue Jianyong's question, you know, as a historian, um, the very big difference between me and you is that I am a historian. And you probably, uh, is, are, you a, are you a political scientist? Yes. <laughs> Therefore, ah, uh, I usually do not do counterfactual you know, uh, argument. But in this case, I very much would like to discuss with you because this is such a good question. Mao mattered. Mao mattered tremendously. If Mao died in 1966, and we knew there would have never been the Cultural Revolution, and certainly not the Cultural Revolution as it had happened in Chinese history. If Mao even died early, say 1956, it would even be better, because some Maoist disastrous experiments, such as anti-rightist movement, Great Leap Forward, would not never have happened. And something you know, different still revolutionary programs would have happened, but not to the extreme ends that Mao would try to push to. Therefore, Mao mattered. Having said that, let me say two things. One is that in the actual situation that China had experienced under Mao's rule, this is what I'm you know, discussing now, and then you find the Cultural Revolution had been pushed toward exactly the opposite direction that Mao would like to push to. And Mao finally, interesting, despite his unlimited power and authority, he became himself the prisoner of the circumstances that he had uh, 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 created. Therefore, you know, in our study, we still have some discussion about how could this development-oriented thesis be introduced we believe that was also not completely incompatible with Mao's definition of the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Revolution. Still, it was so different in terms of representation from Mao's original cultural revolution languages. So chairman finally was defeated by the very circumstances he himself created. After all, Historical forces are much larger than any single person, even a very powerful, a most powerful dictator. Now, this would not be LSE ideas, as some of you know, if uh, there weren't a few forthcoming events that we need to announce. We have two tomorrow. You can spend a whole day with us tomorrow if you like to. Uh, starting at 11 a.m. Uh, in this building, um, on this floor, LGO3, Jamie Shea, um, the Director of, of Policy Planning uh, in NATO, will be speaking on NATO from Kosovo to Afghanistan. And then in the afternoon, starting a quarter to two over in LSE Ideas, B212, um, a Ideas and Contemporary, uh, Center for Contemporary British History Witness Seminar Britain and South Africa's road to democracy. And both, I think, would be quite fascinating uh, events. The next plenary uh, roundtable that we have here is on the 3rd of February, Russia after Georgia, with uh, Professor Margaret Light, uh, Professor Marie Mendras, and Dr. Bobo Lowe, and with Professor Michael Cox in the chair. I want to thank Professor Chen Jian for a quite outstanding uh, lecture here tonight. Filled, if I may say so, with new evaluations of the period that he's looking at. But even though he stressed many times that he's an historian, I don't think I ever met an historian who is more preoccupied with the present and particularly the future than what Professor Chen Jian is. Um, this is, I think, what makes him so incredibly well suited for evaluating the past, 
If you want to understand the past in the broadest possible sense, you can only do it if you have real concerns about the time we live in today. And that is what Professor Chen Yuan showed in his eminent lecture today. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us.